morning's scripture. First Corinthians chapter seven, verses one through five. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Good morning! I have never been so happy that we have children's church. Um, <laughs> sorry, that one slipped up. <laughs> no, the fact is, this is in the Bible, and this is going to be a weird lesson today. If you think I'm only talking to the married, you need to pay attention to the second part. If you think I'm not talking to the married, listen to the first part. The fact is that God is particular about all aspects of marriage. Whether we're talking about the importance of marriage, whether we're talking about the emphasis we have placed on marriage. The Catholic Church has this thing where they tell their priests they can't marry. The Church of Christ have this habit where they tell their ministers they have to be married. I hate to tell you, neither one is right. Paul is very clear here. And what he's going to talk about first is he's going to talk about marriage. And so often we want to look at marriage, we'll look at Colossians or Ephesians, and we'll talk about how the husband is head of the wife. And we always go to this. And I don't know if it's because men are the only ones preaching or men are the only ones teaching. That might be a little slip in it. The fact is, though, we like to go to those passages because they're simple. This passage right here we're going to talk about is very difficult because it says not that somebody has authority over the other person and it also isn't one of an equal relationship what we just talked about was a, a situation where everybody's submissive and nobody's equal because it, it describes one situation in which the husband has a desire for the wife and the wife doesn't have a desire for the husband and there's a submission there but if that works in reverse, there's a submission there. And the last thing you should get from this is equality. Equality has no place within Christianity because it is all about serving. Christ talked about this. Remember, he said, if you want to be the greatest you can possibly be, you need to be a servant, right? It is all about service. And if we take this and we get this foreign concept of equality, it wouldn't work with passages like Ephesians. Or Colossians, when we do talk about the male headship. But if we take this as a situation in which you have two people completely in submission to the third person in the marriage, it looks pretty different. There's a phrase in here that I want you to realize is only in Christianity. Only Christians would ever think of this concept. So that you may devote yourselves to prayer, right? If you agree. There's a teaching in the church that I have always condemned because I've never been able to find it. How many of you have ever been told that the man is in charge of all spiritual affairs? Those phrases are not in the Bible. It talks about male headship. It does not say this phrase about men being in charge of everything spiritual. And in here, I want you to see this thing. They said, stop depriving one except by agreement. So who is that? Who's in authority if we agree? Nobody, right? We agreed. We worked it out. We agreed. And this is a phrase that Jews hated. Because what it said is that spiritually we're equals. Jesus put it in Galatians. He said, there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ. And when he says we talk about spiritual affairs, what we need to talk about is my wife may be the biggest spiritual leader in my family. She may be the one who draws me the closest to God, 
And that's okay. As long as we maintain that male headship, there's nothing wrong with my wife and I agreeing, working together to draw closer to God. But let's continue in verses 6 through 9. We're going to talk more about this whole why marriage and what's it all about. Verse 6, But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God. One in this manner, another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, who am I talking to now? Unmarried and widows. That it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. There's a good reason to get married and there's a bad reason. Because you're supposed to is a bad reason. Because everybody does it, bad reason. A good reason that the Bible actually condones is to control lust. The only reason we're going to find in Scripture that says you should marry is going to say that if you have lust. Now, he says that it is better to remain as him. He said if you had that gift, if you had the ability to be a widow, it's better. If you had that ability to have self-control, it's better. This is so foreign to everything we've ever heard in church. I was, I'm from a very country town. We still like the first commandment in the Bible, be fruitful and multiply. I, I really thought I was going to get married when I left college, but my scholarship said no, so that didn't happen. And it, it's normal where I'm from to think about you turn 18, you should probably be married, or what's wrong with you? You know, a 30-year-old who isn't married has a problem. I don't know, they made a movie about this, The 30-Year-Old Virgin. This is our society that says, at some point you meet that person because everybody's got a soulmate and at point everybody's supposed to get married and no. No. This is not even logical to say that everyone should get married because God says that everybody's different. You may be that person who never gets married and you choose to serve for God and you're not distracted by a husband. You're not distracted by married life. At the end of the day, I can't serve ministry 100% of the time. And I know this because my son is my most important ministry. And my wife is my co-worker in my ministry. So when God speaks of widows, I want you to look at widowhood and go, not that something's wrong with being a widow or a widower, but something is good about it. It's not as though you're inferior for not being married. It's as though you're different. You have this opportunity as a widow that, you know what, married people don't. Because if you're not taking time to take care of your wife, you're neglecting part of your ministry. But if you don't have one, or you don't have a husband to have to cook for every night at such and such time. Right? If you don't have that extra weight on you, you have a little extra opportunity to serve God. And you are by no means inferior. And he wants to present this. He says, if you have that gift, it's good. But he continues in verse 10 and 11. I'm switching back to the married. Don't get confused who we're at. But to the married I give instruction, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she can sense to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? 
In verses 10 and 11, it's, it's slightly different. It's talking to those who are married to a Christian. And the idea is, if you are married to a Christian, you stay married. It doesn't give a lot of ands, ifs, any of that. It doesn't talk about the whys, doesn't talk about any of that. It just simply assumes that you know, if you are married to a Christian, you stay married. If something happens and that has to be dissolved for whatever reason, widowhood. We already talked about it. You have an opportunity then to become and serve as a widow. Serve as an unmarried person who can fully devote themselves to God. Jesus spoke of this. He has this weird phrase in the middle of all of it, and he starts talking about Enoch's. Enoch's are people who generally can't get married. They have devoted themselves fully to something to the point they cannot get married. And he says some are made Enoch's by men. And some choose to be Enoch's. Some people choose to serve God. And this is one of those things where God's leaving that as an option. He's saying if something happens and it's, it's worse to stay in a marriage filled with hate than to separate. And you can't find yourself in that state. Then you know what? Being widowed, being single, being unmarried is not bad. And it is an opportunity to serve. But the last part of that, 12 through 16, goes back to what we we're talking about. I, I, I challenge you to rethink about this whole Ephesians concept of shoving in spirituality in the middle of a headship. If you take your spiritual life and you say, my husband is the head, it's his job, leave it all on him. How personal is your relationship with God? If your husband or wife dies, you should have enough relationship with your God, your Jesus, your Holy Spirit. You should have enough relationship that that person can disappear without losing the relationship with God. And he talks about this. He says, if there's a believing wife, you know who's going to wind up being the spiritual head? The wife. You might be the one to bring your husband to salvation. Husbands. You might be the one to bring your wife to salvation. But more than that, it may not be a matter of salvation. They may be Christians. But you can be that model. Too often we've allowed marriages to be run in such a way that spirituality... We've got a ladder. No, we've got a ladder in order. We've got a ladder in the husband makes the final decision. We don't have a ladder in spirituality. If, if Paul is saying that a widow, a woman without a husband, is just as good as a married woman, then don't dare think that a woman with a husband is no longer spiritual. There have been times in my life that I am glad that my wife is as spiritual as she is. I'm glad that she called me on the carpet. Ooh, I just gave her authority, didn't I? Oh, she called me on the carpet. She has. My wife has called me on the carpet. It is so easy to teach something and then ignore the application to yourself. Just a habit. And it is so nice to have a wife who's not afraid to be a spiritual leader. Now, we're not dealing with the church or any of that stuff. We're talking all about marriage and single women and women realizing, guess what? You're vital. God designed everything in such a way that women may not be the authority in churches. But I'm pretty sure I remember a story of Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla's a female, by the way. She's mentioned first, which is a little weird at the time. And they go out and they teach the gospel. Female evangelists. Females teaching. And right here we have something beautiful too. We have females winning their husbands. Still a form of evangelism and women realizing that, guess what? Your husbands need you. The men need you. 
And if we're talking about widows, we have the same thing going on. We have that women should still be spiritual. Timothy had faith. Timothy has been, Paul decided to blame two people on Timothy's faith. Was it his dad and his grandpa? Hmm. No. Man. Timothy, Paul said, you know, your first, which first existed in your mother and your grandmother. Wait, wait a second. Wait a your mother and your grandmother, both of which are assumed to be which sex? I'm pretty good at math, but I think I know which sex they are. Just guessing. I'm not an expert in Greek, but I think those words mean male and female, right? Mother would be female. Grandmother would be female. How radical is it if we decided that, yes, the stuff that we do here that seems so important to us and we put so much emphasis on, maybe it's not the biggest things. Maybe getting up here and preaching to encourage the church and revitalize the church isn't the most essential thing. Maybe passing around a tray is not the most essential thing. Maybe reading scripture, maybe praying in front of people is not the most essential thing. Because the truth of the matter is women have been winning souls for Christ since the beginning of Christianity. Women have been taking the gospel to people. They have been supporting Christ's ministry. They have been having churches in their houses since the beginning. And those things that we consider so important really don't matter as much as building relationships with God. And no matter where you stand, this is one of those passages that is overlooked because the church has gone real extreme in one direction. We're so afraid that that male headship in a marriage won't be respected that we can't even allow ourselves just for a second to consider that women are extremely powerful. And I don't mean in a sense of being lords over their husbands or being in control of a church or being elders or any of that business. But where a woman in her humility and submissiveness in 2 Peter says, how do you not know that by your godly behavior, those husbands who are ungodly will not be won? How do you know if you're going to win your husband? How do you know if you are not a voice that's easier to listen to? I don't know how many of y'all were converted by females. <laughs> I've told you, Mama Landrum. She was very submissive to her husband. There's no question. Very, very strict legalist church. When her husband was an elder, there is no real question there. But she didn't take that and go, well, my husband's spiritual. He's an elder. She went, I am spiritual. I have a relationship with God. I can tell you about Jesus. And I'm so glad she didn't follow the model where she goes, it has to be a guy to teach you about Jesus. We've got some really great women in this congregation who are good at telling people about Jesus. And God never says anything against it. God never once says that any of this is wrong. He doesn't go in right here and he doesn't say, you know, you need to be careful with your husband, right? He's the spiritual head. He's spiritually in charge. They leave it completely open and say, how do you know if you won't save your husband? So quit treating yourselves as second class. You're not. There are orders, there are roles, but none of this requires a woman not to be the most spiritual, powerful individual because they are so connected to a God who is limitless in power.
And today you are left with something to be reminded of. I don't know what your relationship you're in. God is very particular about marriage. He says he wants it to be hold hell holy. But he never says anything where just because you're a woman doesn't mean you don't help your husband spiritually. Doesn't mean that if your husband's struggling, you're not there to go, you know what? Let me help you reconnect to God. And if you're a widow or a widower, don't consider your position less. Consider it, as he says, slightly better. You've got more time to focus on God. You've got more time to serve God. And do it. And no matter what position you find yourself in, be as spiritually connected to God as you can be. And don't put it on anybody else. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. The phrase before it talks about there is neither male nor female. But this phrase right here talks about being in Christ. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That is what is offered to us by Christ, is a oneness where we are all sons. We are all children of God. And in spirituality, no one is greater or lesser, but in each position you are called, you are called to serve God. God has offered us an invitation where he sent his son to die for us, and having believed that he has done that, confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of our sins and giving our sins over to him, being buried with him in baptism and raised as children of God to serve him. Or if there's somebody who has not been serving God faithfully, there's something you'd like to bring before the congregation or you need prayers or you'd like to submit to the eldership here. We ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing. Bye.